Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, this is the Battle of Agincourt. It occurred October 25th, or St. Crispin's Day of uh, 1415. And we've already talked a little bit about how uh, Henry V, leading the British forces, he's the king of England, leading his forces, uh, has been rampaging throughout France, and then decides it's time to go home. And so he's heading up north. And what's going to happen is he is going to be shadowed by an extremely large French army. And uh, what's going to happen is by this point in the campaign, uh, Henry V's men are suffering. They're hungry, they want to go home, and they're suffering from something called dysentery. Dysentery is like diarrhea on steroids. Uh, it was so bad that a lot of, according to, according to sources, a lot of the regular uh, archers would take their regular old breeches and they would cut the backsides out of them so that they could just stand on the battlefield and do whatever it is that they had to do. <laughs> that's, that's, that's interesting. All right? So maybe I have to edit that out too. But the, the thing is, the British wanted to head home. The French overtook them. And the French blocked the northern advance of uh, Henry V. Now, here's the deal. You take a look at the numbers here. This is, this is very telling. The French had somewhere, now this is a, a high range, right? 36,000 men. They may have had up to 36,000 men. Uh, many of them were men-at-arms, meaning they were basically knights who just didn't have horses, right? So they were heavily armored. Uh, then there was 1,200 cavalry. Those are knights on horses. These are knights in full armor. This is the flower of French chivalry. Anyone who was ever, anyone in France was on this battlefield. This is where all the sons of the nobles were and where all the nobles were, right? This is where you wanted to be. They had large numbers of regular short bowmen and crossbowmen, and they had large numbers of regular infantry. Now, your regular infantry just doesn't have the nicest armor. They're still, they can still put up a fight because there's a lot of them, all right? Up against 6,000 English under Henry V, of which 1,000 of them were your of men at arms or the, the dismounted knights, still heavily armored, but there's only only a thousand of them versus nine thousand men at arms that are equal, and then a whole bunch of other just general infantry. Okay, so the numbers are pretty scary. However, the English do have the the new technology that we talked about just a little bit ago, the longbow. And there there are about five thousand longbowmen. Right? But these guys are, are sick and they want to go home. These guys know that they have caught Henry V in a trap. All right, Because Henry V has to fight at some point and he has to travel north. If you take a look at this battlefield that occurred near the city of Agincourt, what you have here is woods on this side, woods over here, and then in the middle fields. These are fields that had been recently plowed, and it had been raining. So these fields are muddy, right? No big deal, but right in the middle it's muddy, and it also funnels you a bit. If you take a look here and you take a look here, you can have large numbers of troops here, but when they start to move in this direction, it's going to funnel them in. Now, what that's going to do for the English is it's going to give them a slight non-disadvantage. It's not an advantage, they can't really take uh, a, full adv a full advantage of this simply because they had low numbers. But what it is going to do is it's going to limit the numbers of French that can attack them. Remember the Battle of Thermopylae? Yeah. All right. A similar thing is going to happen. All right. So what occurs is this. The English under Henry V march up here. And they actually, when they started the battle, they were kind of here, all right, to give you an idea. They were out of bow range. They, could, they couldn't even hit these guys. These guys were sitting there basically going, come on, 
we have overwhelming numbers. And yeah, Henry's sitting there going, wow, there's a lot of them. And these guys know that they're not going home if they don't win. That's an incentive. So what happens is Henry has to fight. He can't sit here because he's hungry and his men are sick. These guys can sit here as long as they want because they have close supply lines. They're in France. It's their territory. So they're just content to sit there. So what Henry V does is he, his camp is back here, just so you know. So he leaves his camp followers back here, any horses, pack horses that they have, uh, even his crown is back here, just so you know. Uh, and they're being guarded by uh, the pages and squires. These are young boys who are training to become knights. So they're, they're, they're going to be basically 14-year-olds. A bunch of 14-year-olds are hanging back here, pretty young. All right. What happens is Henry V is going to move his troops forward to get them just within effective <coughs> bow range. We've already talked about what effective bow range is, so we know it's going to be somewhere between 200 and 400-ish meters. The farthest anyone has ever shot a traditional longbow is 635 meters. What does that mean in feet? It's long. All right, so here's, I'll do math later, all right, and I'll put it on the screen and it'll look really intelligent. So here's the deal. Henry moves his troops up to effective bow range. What he does, and this is a smart thing, he puts a couple of his archers in the woods hiding, right, on the wings. Then what he does is he has his other archers move up and they take stakes and they sharpen one end and then they drive it into the ground. So it's facing the opposite direction. And what they do with these stakes is they're going to hide behind them. <laughs> the thought is horses will impale themselves on these stakes. That's the hope. They've got to have some kind of protection. And then what uh, Henry does is he puts his very small number of men-at-arms right in the middle. Now, what's interesting about this, this is a tactic that people are going to use in the future. A good example would be uh, the trenches during World War I. You put your barbed wire here and here to funnel the enemy into your machine guns. Yeah. All right? So what Henry wanted to do was funnel the enemy into his men-at-arms, right? Once you get too close to an archer, an archer is no longer terribly effective. They've got to stick with a string. And if you're close, it's like, <laughs> you're not going to be able to do anything, all right? So he wants these guys to engage these guys. But the numbers are just astronomically against the English. Well, what happens is this. These guys apparently, according to legend, do a couple of things to try to entice the French to attack. One of them is they start shooting arrows. Now, none of these arrows are going to make a difference because it's, it's, it's at the extreme range. So they're going to be annoying. If you happen to be standing under one and you don't have good armor on, it's going to, it's going to ruin your day. But it's not going to have a real impact except to get you angry. And the French were getting angry that these arrows were raining down on them. And then, apparently, according to some chroniclers, the archers started flashing their fingers at the French. All right? And they were, no, not like this. <laughs> Hello? What they were doing is they were flashing two fingers. The reason they were doing this, supposedly, is because the French had stated that any longbowman that they captured would have those two fingers chopped off so they could never fire a longbow again. All right? Now, here's the deal. You guys know you fire a longbow with three fingers. Obviously, the French didn't get that. But it doesn't matter. And so here you have the English longbowmen basically flipping off the French. This is funny. It just is. They're, and so what happens is the French finally get incensed. They're like, insolence. And so what they did is they're going to charge. They didn't have to, but they decided to. And what they're going to do is they're going to charge with their cavalry. The cavalry, which is like tanks. These have always won battles. This is what you win the battle with, your heavy armored cavalry. And so they charge forward. <laughs> All right. Now, as they 
they charged forward, it caused a little bit of disruption within the ranks, not too big of a deal. But they started to go this way and they hit the mud. When they hit the mud, it's going to cause some issues because the horses are going to slow down. Now, we've done some archaeological tests and we've been able to figure out uh, where the French soldiers who were killed, where they were killed and how they were killed. And you can take a look at the angle of the penetration of the arrows, the bodkin tips that we talked about. And the soldiers that were killed looked like they were all killed at point blank range. Meaning that even though these guys, the archers, started launching arrows immediately, they weren't terribly effective against the soldiers themselves. It might hurt parts of horses and it might have injured some of the knights, but it didn't kill them until they got close. They're going through this mud, they're heading this way. That was when the bodkin arrows and the longbows started to make a difference. Because at relatively close range, a bodkin is going to go through the armor of a French knight. And it would go through their regular armor and they even found that it could, it could go into their visors if it hit, and their helmets were the strongest part of any of their armor. If it hit on any of the breathing holes, or the eye slits. I'm here to tell you that if a bodkin goes into your eye slit, that is going to mess up your day. If it goes in through one of the breathing holes, it's going to hit you in the face. You do not want a three foot long arrow stuck in your face. And this is what the French knights started to experience once they got close. The horses also banged up against these poles, the stakes that were in the ground. Those horses, the cavalry, crushed up against here and couldn't move forward. They're now standing with a guy on a horse. The horse is kind of stopped, being pushed by horses behind it. Point blank range with a guy who has a longbow. And they're just going to pepper, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> they're going to pepper these guys with arrows. Now, yes, some cavalry is going to go up here and they're going to really, really, really cause problems here. But what the French didn't also recognize was that there were guys here. So they're getting hit with arrows on the flanks. The further forward they move, the more these guys are behind them shooting into their unprotected backs. This is a real problem. What's going to happen is eventually the French knights are going to recognize this is not working. It's not working. Let's retreat. They just couldn't break through. And so they're going to retreat. Now, as they retreat, it's going to be an interesting affair because they kind of did this kind of stuff for a while. Then eventually they go back through the mud and they get themselves kind of back here. There's not nearly as many of them. All right. Now, what's fascinating about this, some of those guys had been taken prisoner, a few of them. And so they're back here. Not a lot of them. There's dead and dying people all over here. The French then decide, we need to launch a second assault. And this one's going to be an infantry assault. The infantry is going to walk across here and engage the English. All right? These guys move forward. Now, a horse running across muddy terrain is one thing. An individual in full armor under fire is another. And so it must have been extremely heroic for these French soldiers to march into mud, the quagmire of battle, knowing that there's a whole bunch of archers just waiting to shoot them. But they did it anyway. And these guys moved forward. And when they attacked, they automatically started to form a wedge. The reason they did this, they didn't want to deal with these guys. And so what happens is the bulk of all of these guys are going to be right here, right? They're all going to kind of move this way. But look at how many there are here versus this. This is a real problem, all right? That's a lot of guys. What will obviously happen is these guys are going to be pressed back, all right? The men at arms will be pressed back. The archers are shooting at point-blank range. These guys push forward. 
right, you might be able to figure out what's starting to happen. What's starting to happen? Any ideas? They're gonna, there's a possibility they can be encircled. Absolutely. So what's happening is this huge number of guys is in here, and what the archers start to do, instead of shooting them, because actually, they're starting to run out of arrows. The archers go out here and they grab swords from the dead, and then the archers do this. And the archers are attacking these guys. Who are attacking these guys? This is a huge mess, but the issue is these guys should win. There's more of them. But the combined assault from all sides by arrows and by swords starts to take its toll. Three hours later, three hours later, Henry V jumps into the thick of the fight himself. He's specifically targeting the leaders of the French. All right, this is cool. I mean, war's horrible, but this is cool. And what you have is right in the middle of this, you have the King of England fighting. All right, what's going to occur? What's going to occur at this point? Something very strange. Some of these cavalry guys are going to swing around here. This could be a big deal. They didn't receive any orders, but they did it anyway. What's going to occur is finally, finally, these guys are going to start breaking up. And they're going to be forced to retreat. But here's, there's a lot fewer of them. But here's the deal. They've retreated back into a still massive army. If this massive army charges then there's going to be a real problem. Henry's got a, a, an interesting issue to deal with also. The number of prisoners that he has has swollen. He almost has more prisoners than he has soldiers. And so chivalry dictates that if they are knights, they should be treated in a special way. If they have surrendered, they, they need to be protected. Unfortunately, these knights swung around and attacked the English camp. They even stole Henry V's crown. They also killed the squires. You don't do that. You don't kill unarmed squires. Henry V apparently hears about that. And he orders all of these guys to be killed. He says, kill all the prisoners. The men-at-arms who are knights categorically refuse. They will not do it. So Henry says to his archers, you guys want to kill some knights? And they're like, yeah, we'll kill some knights. <laughs> and so they did. They grabbed weapons, they grabbed daggers, and they flipped up the visors of the knights and they shoved it in their eye sockets. They, because they, they're wearing their armor still, they, they put their daggers through the armpits, which was an area that you could get to them. You stick a dagger in the armpit, do a little bit of this, that person's going to die. They did the same here in the groin area. That's how you kill these knights. And they killed a lot of them. A lot of them were killed as prisoners. So these guys are no longer a factor. Henry V believed that when these guys attacked, that these prisoners would no longer be prisoners. They might rise up. As it was, just so you know, these guys said, fighting is stupid. And they left. These guys left the battlefield. These guys were already gone, and these guys moseyed away too. The English are left on the battlefield with a whole bunch of dead French prisoners. They didn't have to do it, but they did. Henry V wins this battle because the French withdrew. Henry V then can continue his advance to get the heck out of France. But this battle was such a big deal. It was such a big deal, and it's really going to impact subsequent world history. But let me tell you a little bit about the numbers so you see what the heck is going on. The French, not only did they, did they lose many of their leaders, but they also ended up losing about 10,000 men. 10,000. You think about the English, they only had 6,000 to start with. So the French lost 10,000 men, plus they ended up keeping about 1,500 French prisoners, those that they didn't kill. All right? <clears throat> English losses were about 600. All right? And so that gives you an idea 
that utilizing what little defense you have, those pointed sticks, and a, a new super weapon makes a big difference on the battlefield. Now, unfortunately, Henry V is not going to be able to consolidate his real gains because he is going to die of dysentery. Right? Had he lived, he could have, hold on just a second, had he lived, he might have been able to take over all of France. Here's the other thing that you guys need to know. This is going to dramatically impact world history. Battles are no longer going to be decided, at least for a very long time, by heavy cavalry. Yes, cavalry will still occasionally be used. All right, that's going to happen. But now battles are going to be dictated by ranged fire. Not someone getting close to you and stabby stabby, but someone being far away and launching something at you. Initially, it's the longbow, and then very quickly, it's going to be gunpowder. It's going to be guns. All right? That's a huge change. The next change is the fact that knights are no longer the king of the battlefield. You cannot send a knight onto the battlefield without effective infantry support, or they're going to get holes put in them. All right? We know this today. We don't use knights anymore. We use tanks. And tanks are heavily armored, they're mobile, and they can really make a lot of damage occur. But even today, you don't send a tank alone into like an urban environment because the enemy can take them out. You have to have infantry support with them, and it helps to also have air support. All right? Another crazy thing is this war is going to be really the last war of the medieval period. Lots of historians, we like to have dates where we can say this was the beginning of this and I can start a new chapter. Well, this is really going to be the end of the medieval era. The disintegration of the feudal system that really started with the plague is going to continue because the, the flower of French chivalry, the, the knights are no longer going to be the most important person out there. You don't want to be a knight because everyone is going to target you and you're going to be a pincushion. That's unpleasant. So you're going to have the end of an era and within just a few years the Renaissance is going to begin Italy which is a completely new era and a class that you should take is AP Modern European History. I really like the teacher. All right. Any questions? Fantastic. Thanks guys. Cool. No. <laughs> when I, I'm sorry. Whenever you said um, French knights, I thought of the one from Monty Python. Of course you did. How can <laughs> you not? It takes me everything I have to not say knigets. <laughs> uh.